All right, very nice intro. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about networking equipment because um, let's say networking equipment is still a little bit like Stone Age compared to what guys do in like the systems kind of world. So, and in the last 10 years or so, things have been getting better and better and actually being able to do things in a little more automated, orchestrated kind of fashion. Um, and Python has become very, very popular f between like network engineers and network operators to, to do and automate things. So I want to show you guys a couple of, well, first, first kind of give you an overview what network engineers actually do and what the pain points are that we care about. Um, and then show you a couple of Python libraries that we use that are available these days that make life so much easier than it used to be before. You introduced me so nicely already, so I don't really have to say much about myself anymore here. Um, I, let's see, well, yeah, I started all this about 10 years ago, so I've been working in this industry for a long time. Uh, 10 years ago, we had nothing and we were using SSH to get into a router and that's pretty much it. And I, I was very lucky working at a couple of really big companies that um, had a big networks and gained a lot of experience there with various equipment and various vendors, etc. And all of those kind of automation projects, are is, it's all very project based. You kind of go in and you help them set up something in a particular um, for a particular project and then that's kind of done. So for the past five years or so, um, I'm freelancing for those companies, just setting up automation projects and moving on and setting up the next one kind of thing. So I've seen a lot of setups by now and uh, I work from home, so I live in Krakow, not that far away. That's why I'm here because we only had to drive a couple of hours to come visit and yeah, unfortunately go to the US a lot, hopefully not anymore these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get going. So network engineering. What, uh, who's, who's done anything with network engineering before here? Who's logged into Cisco's Junipers? Anything? Okay, a little bit. That's good. That's good. Um, we typically care about like those, all those weird acronyms that you have in networking, you know, BGP, MPLS, all kinds of like protocols that the ITF comes up with and they try and standardize it. Unfortunately, um, Standardizing something at the ITF doesn't mean that the vendor then ends up implementing it all the same way, which is probably the case for other standards too. So that's usually a big pain point when you come in and an implementation is different on this device and then different on another device. That's usually, um, that's usually a big problem. And then um, the router sense, which is that people use in like large scale networks are more kind of that kind of thing. Like I, we've been putting boxes into racks that are taller than me. Um, typically, all the vendors that do like small kind of pizza boxes that are, you know, this size routers, um, they have even less on um, automation or interfaces available than you would like to have. So those bigger boxes tend to be like, you know, they're selling them for really, really expensive, so they kind of need to get a move on with, okay, here's an API that you might be able to do something with now. and. If you get like your little microtech router, you're probably, <clears throat> it's probably harder to get there. They, they tend to have used their OS for like the past 15 years or so, and it's the same still versus like Cisco and Juniper are able to develop it somehow um, further and further. So that's getting, it's getting a little bit better if you're lucky to work with equipment that costs more money, basically. <laughs> So the pain points really, the pain points really are that um, a lot of the, a lot of the changes and a lot of the network engineers are just used to it. Their job on a day-to-day -day basis is um, sit there and watch that box and then if they need to change something, they log into the CLI and they type some commands and stuff changes and okay, but they need to do it over and over and over again again and then if you ultimately just end up you know the same as in operations really same as in server operations too the same way um things become more automated and orchestrated you don't want to have one engineer log into one box you want to be have have an engineer be able to you know log into multiple do something a little bit in a more organized fashion monitor them all at the same time instead of just typing, typing, typing everything by hand. So, so that's, that's very, very annoying. And if you work with the vendors um, that, that come out with the bigger equipment, things change really, really fast. So the, the micro ticks that use the same OS for the past 15 years, 
uh, on, like, on like Cisco, they came out with four different OSs for different routers in the past five years probably. So it's all, it's all changing very fast and you kind of need to keep up on, on what hardware you use and what vendor you use and what to do there exactly. And that's what network engineers are trained for, right? They go, maybe a couple of you, because I've heard the university here has a, has a networking um, specialty somehow, so maybe some of you uh, learned about this if you're here at the university, uh, how, to, yeah, how to use, so you go into like a Cisco class and you learn how to use one particular vendor on one particular OS and that's it. And then, you know, a different one comes along and it all looks a little bit differently. So what do we want to automate? Because um, it could just all go on the same way and no one would really care because the network engineers are happy and have jobs and just keep doing it the same way they've been doing it so far. But, you know, learning is kind of the fun thing about it, at least for me. So changing things and doing them differently. Um, so the things we try to automate as much as we can in, in, in networks is, of course, device and service provisioning, because like you, you have services, I don't know, it could be something simple like um, you have a router and you peer with a lot of different people, or you have some upstreams on there, etc. And those things, uh, they change. You set up new peers, you make new agreements, you add new sessions to it, etc. So, so having to type this every single time by hand gets annoying. So we're trying to provision devices automatically as much as possible um, and services that those devices offer. There's a lot about telemetry going on and here data people in the first row. We need to talk about this some more because they do give you a lot of information, right? The same way you have logs and counters coming from servers, the same way you have logs and counters coming from networking equipment. On top of that, you get NetFlow and SFlow, which gives you uh, much more in-depth uh, detail on the traffic that goes over uh, those devices, which you can analyze. But the problem is there is no tools or there was no tools available until now that would do that. Everything, you know, even if you just want to collect S-Flow data off a device, it's an incredible amount of work to set up, set up the software, set up collectors, set it all up. If you have a big network and lots of traffic, set it up in a scalable way somehow. Um, so there is no like off the shelf solution where I go, show me my graphs and this is it. And then we've talked about this last night. You have the software, you set it up, show me my graphs, and then you look at those graphs, but then what, right? All those like data pipelines these days do so many fancy things that that would be great to, um, to do on that kind of data too. Cause you know, there's a, there's a lot that you could infer from, um, from looking at traffic patterns from, you know, something that was lots of this green traffic going on and then suddenly it dropped down to zero and that will probably say you tell you something about that something went wrong right if you could correlate that with like your routing table or other information that you have on those devices you would probably be able to but we're not this is this is all dreaming right now we're definitely not there yet um Monitoring, you're all like, you know, all the topics that I'm mentioning here are sitting right in the first row. So we've got data, we've got monitoring, we use monitoring tools. Um, you get your logs out of like syslog and then you want to do like some alerting on it, etc. But then you monitor for different things, right? You don't have a server that you monitor for its CPU load or something like that. You've got, you know, you want to monitor I don't know, stupid example, you have a peering session and they announce a number of routes to you and suddenly they announce more routes or less routes or one route that you know that you don't want to have, definitely. So those are all kind of special rules that you need to monitor for and none of the software you can set up out of the box and say, okay, alert me on all of those different cases. It usually requires for you to like go in, write plugins for it, check for the specific rule set, which is a really hard thing to do because you don't, you know, you need to learn what you want to monitor for and then start alerting on it. So it's all a, a process to like getting there. Some one rule might be important in one network, but it might not be important at all in a different network. So um, I'm trying to think because there was like a, a story from like one network they were very very panicky about every time a BGP session went down everything was terrible and oh my god and that can't happen and that's so awful and that's so awful and then a different network I was working on they were like oh we don't even care they just go up and down all the time we have so much backup like it doesn't even matter if it's up or down right so people have different 
um, interests in, in, in what defines their network in a broken state or not in a broken state. So that's usually um, an interesting thing. And then troubleshooting, um, I wrote that down because a lot of times the same things break in the same fashion and then the network engineer comes in and he needs to do the same five, six steps to fix it. And it's always the same five or six steps. So there is ways to automate those steps as well if you know what you're looking for, right? So then if you're a big company and you have a big team of people and you write software around your network, it might look like this. And then you end up with a lot of different tools and you have all the software engineers and they, you know, they just write a ton of things for a ton of things for it. Unfortunately, not every company has that many people that can A write code um, and B work on things like that. So so I've got some friends at Facebook, they they're giving presentation about like their um, network. Um, software stack and it looks like this and this is amazing like oh my god okay they have that many tools that like monitor for things and alert on stuff and do all those things automatically if you're you know if you're the small network that doesn't have a team of 20 people then you cannot do that probably um, so we're trying to find you know open source software or things that kind of help you do this in an easier manner that are not necessarily well it had there, there always has to be some portion of it that is hand written for the particular use case, but there is a couple of things that people can reuse all around um, that can be shared. So that's a nice thing. Um, okay, so accessing devices, because uh, once you, wanna, you want to automate something on your device, you need to get to it somehow, right? Um, the, traditionally, all of devices were managed via the CLI or like Telnet or something like that. So you log in, you type things line by line. Uh, it's not transactional. So I mean, if even if you take and like copy and paste 10 lines and something breaks after the fifth, boom. Now you've got like, now you're somewhere in the middle of your state, in the, in the middle of your desired state, right? You wanted to be there, you came from there and you ended up somewhere there. How do you now roll it back to either what it was originally or get to the point where you originally wanted to go. Um, using Telnet or CLI is a big problem for things like that because you kind of need to step by step follow what's actually going on. Uh, Telnet started going away, people started using SSH, okay, better in a sense that it's SSH, but it really doesn't help you that much in like it's still not transactional, so it's still a CLI and it still has exactly the same problems. Um, so yeah, that's you know the same problem that you would have configuring a server over SSH and trying to like change your configs there. It would be exactly the same thing. Um, and then you have differences between the devices that make it even harder. So if you type something on the CLI on one router, it doesn't mean that you have to type exactly the same thing on a different router. We can probably... I don't know, I can probably compare that to like, I wanna configure my Apache and I wanna configure my Nginx, right? They have different syntax, but ultimately you wanna, you set up very similar things, right? You set up, I don't know, amounts of sessions that you allow, et cetera, et cetera, but they just end up having a different syntax. Um, there's vendors that are kind of clean in a sense, they have one OS and they develop that one OS further across the different, across the different hardware branches they have. And then there's vendors like Cisco who basically for every new hardware branch come up with a different OS, which is, which is nice because the new OSs are easier to manage, um, at least from an automation standpoint. But, but then you always end up with like the old Cisco boxes that you have to manage differently and the new Cisco boxes that you again have to manage differently. So it's, this is all, this is all not so cool. Um, okay, so configurations look kind of like this. Um, this is on, this is on the left side. On the left side, a, a Cisco. On the right side, a Juniper. So, just syntax differences. I think this is actually pretty much the same configuration, or is it not? No, it's not. It's, it's not. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you some. We're gonna we're gonna go through another couple of slides, and then I have some demo things set up here. So we'll actually type and see some things on on actual. Well, I wanted to say actual routers. It's actual VMs on my laptop, but let's say it's actual routers. <laughs> Um, so there is a lot of, uh, in those configurations, they, they tend to be really, really long. Like when I work for people that have very elaborate 
uh, configs, there is a lot of uh, policy and business logic encoded in like filtering or in sessions. Uh, those things get like, you know, three, four, five thousand lines long. So you have to, they're longer than like a typical application configuration because you just encode a lot of logic in them. So it's, it, gets, it gets quite complicated at some point. Um, BGP peering, we had that example. So if you want to add a BGP peer on a Juniper, you would have to do this on the left. If you want to add a BGP peer on a Cisco, you would have to do the thing on the right. So... <laughs> And, and network engineers typically have those little blocks somewhere in like their internal wiki or something like that. And then they take it and paste it and change the IP address. And then there is a typo and it doesn't work and mm -hmm, all of those like similar things. So um, that's all problematic. Uh, and this is all about writing configuration. And then there is the other side of it where you want to um, retrieve data from a device. So. You want to retrieve data to do some kind of monitoring, for example. You want to see, you know, how many, how many MAC addresses are in which VLAN and behind which interface, et cetera, et cetera. So you can retrieve data from, a, from an Arista, and it looks like that. And then you retrieve data from a Juniper, and it looks like this. And it's, it's, you need to screen scrape, right? You need to screen scrape this to get it into a tool to be able to then analyze something on top of it. So, so there's, there's two, to all of the um, software that I'm gonna mention in a little bit here, um, there's always two sides to it. One of it is how do we get configuration uh, into the device or access, automated access, and how do we get um, structured data back from the device that we can then do something with. All good so far? Okay, so then one more thing um, that is interesting, like after, after people were done with SSH and CLI access, um, the ITF came along and said, we're gonna define this thing that is NetConf and NetConf is gonna give you, Net NetConf is gonna, gonna give you like an RPC call access into the devices and you'll be able to configure all the things and it's all gonna be structured in XML and things are gonna be great and amazing. Yes, they're not. <laughs> um, they always end up, they always end up, and that's the, the thing without, I mentioned before, they always end up implementing things in a little bit different way. So um, not every device that is NetConf capable covers all the NetConf functionality that is A in the standard, and then B, even if it returns XML, the XML that comes on from a, from a Cisco still looks different than the XML that comes out from a Juniper. So you, yes, you have structured data, but it's still different structured data. So what do you do if you run a network that has you know, half of Cisco's and half of Juniper's and you wanna monitor all of them with the same tool? Hmm. You cry, exactly. <laughs> you cry and then you just sit there and type lots to make it happen anyways, exactly. This is why I have a job most of the time because like someone just gotta unify it, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so before NetConf was there, um, people unfortunately, so, so now we're getting into Python. Um, uh, there's a lot of libraries available that kind of make things easier and Python has really become the go-to language for network engineers these days, which is kind of fun. I, I started 10 years ago, I started as like the normal network engineer type plugging in cables and like configuring things. And, and 10 years later now, I'm pretty much a full-time Python programmer, which, which got kind of weird there, but I'm not a programmer at all, but okay. <laughs> Gotta do, right, if you have to. Um, who's you, who's you, who has used expect before? Probably a lot of you, right? Expect is kind of the thing that people do even if they don't talk to network devices. You, every once in a while you gotta do expect, then you know how painful it is. Um, if you do expect, it, it, um, it pushes things onto the CLI and then it kind of waits for a particular prompt to return and then you can push the next line, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, a prompt on, a, on one device looks different than a prompt on a different device. So it's the same problem again that you have to like do things and expect differently for every single vendor. Um, Paramico is an SSH library that, that we like to use in the early days uh, before, things became, before things became easier. And then, and, then, um, and then once NetConf came along, there were like those generic um, NetConf libraries, but yeah, still, not making things that super easy, but then, but then people started to get smart about it. And then on top of those generic access libraries, people started 
um, writing more vendor specific stuff. And then even vendors themselves started giving uh, out mostly even open source libraries that people can use. So Arista came up out with like their API library um, that people can use and Cisco has like their own but only for one OS and not for the others. I think they have, uh, they have maybe two now. Um, <laughs> actually the Cisco one I wrote. <laughs> like Cisco didn't, wait, did I just say Cisco came out with this? Because they didn't, okay. <laughs> Juniper came out with theirs. So every vendor started giving you a library and now let's see because I'm Got a couple of demo things prepared here. Let's see if this is gonna work now. Um, so here, if you got a if you got a Juniper device and you've got a Juniper library, you can do things like okay, I've, I've, I've prepared this in a text file and I'm just gonna copy and paste this, so I'm not actually typing this fast. But if you if you want to use the the Juniper library, you do things like this here. Let me just. Let me just paste a portion of this. Okay, so so if you use the Juniper library, you can like you've got like your you've got like your device object going on there. You can do things like open the open a connection to the device. Um, this is a VM on my local laptop right now. Um, you can load a you, you can load a particular configuration that you already have. Uh, you can say lock because you typically there's locking involved too. So you want to lock the config so no one else changes it in the meantime, right? So you lock your config. You load the new configuration. You say yes, commit this thing now. I actually want it. You can do a check in between. Uh, then you actually commit it. You unlock it and you close it again. And this is kind of the way Cisco does it, which is which just makes sense. It's fine. Um, but you know, a different library will, use, will look differently, right? It will not have exactly the same methods available. It will just be slightly, they typically do similar things just in a little bit like slightly different way. So, <laughs> okay, uh, network vendor libraries, that's pretty much all on that. And then um, since they kind of do things the, in, in, a, in a sense, similar, um, and this is actually some a project I was involved in too. Uh, a friend of me, of mine, and I sat down, and we were like, "Okay, but we have three different vendors in a network, and we would like to have a library that just speaks to all of them, right? It cannot be that difficult." And isn't that Python people that like to say that you can probably solve everything with yet another abstraction layer? <laughs> so let's build yet another abstraction layer to make this a little bit easier. So um, my friend David and I sat down and wrote something that, that we called Napalm. Um, Napalm, it, we wanted, it started with we want to burn down those routers because we really hate them at some point, but then it ended into, we found an acronym for it and it went something about, a, a network abstraction layer with multi-vendor support. There is an acronym in there somewhere, trust me. <laughs> We're not that mean. Um, there's NetMiko, um, that, is a, that is a library on top of uh, Paramiko that um, abstracts a couple of things that are different between vendors in terms of SSH access. So like you SSH into one box and like I think it's HP switches that come and give you some weird control characters before you actually get onto the CLI and like the standard SSH library couldn't deal with that and didn't know what to do with it. So it was like, okay. Um, and this guy Kirk wrote NetMiko to, 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 to handle them all. He just kind of tested it. And for like every vendor, there's a little bit of an annoyance that uh, goes around with SSH. So, so that's, a, that's a good one to use. Um, so with Napalm, with Napalm, things look like this. So you import your, you import your, you import your Napalm driver, and then you can do things like, let's open a connection, let's open a connection to an Arista switch. Okay, there's my Arista switch. And then the two things that I mentioned before, so you want to get configuration into your router and you want to get structured, structured data out of your router. Those were kind of the two things that we needed and we're like, okay, let's build them all into Napalm because then we can just do all of the things that we want to do the same way, right? 
So you have, um, so in Napalm, if you want to go and get your interface counters, you do something like that and you get JSON back, right? And if you want to do the same for, if you want to do the same for a Juniper, it would, you open your connection to your, oh, you don't open your connection to your Juniper. Wait, this is not, this is unhappy. Why is this unhappy? Oh man. Okay, whatever. It's still trying to use the, 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 the. never mind. Well, if you would do the same for a Juniper, it would look exactly the same way because you would just get the same the same structured data output for the Juniper, and we kind of came up with we came up with JSON data that will look exactly the same way for for all of the devices. And then you have problems with like one interface, uh, one router reports that set of data, and another report, router reports a different set of data, and there was issues around. Um, trying to fit it all into the same structure and there's something going on, people are calling it open config and they're trying to unify um, how configurations and output looks like, but sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes it's just not, uh, here, I have an example for this too. So if you, so we're actually logged into those routers here. So this is, sorry. I, gotta, I'm not, I don't have this mirrored here, so I gotta look that way. So this is my, this is my Arista switch that I have here, and then there's my my Juniper switch. If I do like a show ARP on a on a Juniper, it looks like that. If I do my uh, show ARP on an Arista, it looks like this, right? It looks, it has one has, what field was it here? One has an H timer. The other one doesn't have an H timer. So even if you define the same JSON output and you want to, you know, report that back out of your library, one just doesn't have a timer. So what do you do? You can't you can't fill it in, right? So you can't do the same things on all of the devices um, at the same time. Yeah, that's a little bit annoying, but okay, we're dealing with all of it. We're dealing with all of it. Okay, and then there's one more thing. So. We'll do a little bit more demo right now because um, network engineers are not really programmers, like I said, N myself neither. So um, Ansible became also very popular on top of Python to because it's, you know, a bash script on steroids and it's kind of easy. Yes, it has a very low entry level to like trying to understand things and um, Network engineers were pretty comfortable with it because they were like, okay, this is not too hard. I can, I can figure out how to put things together in there and I don't actually need to be a programmer to do it. Um, so since Ansible has become so popular, we did a couple of things. Um, and once we had all those backend libraries that we could use that were kind of doing the same thing, uh, we started being able to actually write Ansible modules for all of this that would, that would go and generate things. So. Um, so you can plug, you can take na something like Napalm and all of the, most of the vendor libraries provide um, Ansible modules these days as well. And then Ansible has a big like networking push going on where they wrote their own. So there's a lot of, there's a lot in the Ansible core plus the, uh, plus the additional ones that come out of libraries. So if you plug all of this into Ansible, you would do things like that. Um, so we've seen, I try my screen here again. So we've seen the configuration over there. There is a little bit, I put a little bit of basic config on those VMs just so I can access them. So I gave them like an IP address, um, et cetera. But then let's say, you know, you need a bunch of other system configuration on your router. Like, you know, there's a bunch of like defaults that you want to set that are around like DNS servers and NTP servers that are just there all the time. So I split this into a couple of um, different steps here. So let's say I want to generate my system configuration. So I go ahead and generate my system configuration and then I go and say, okay, merge this into my devices and I'm doing this on both devices at the same time right now. Um, so it's pushing it out using the Napalm module onto like my, onto my two routers right now. And then if I come back here and check my config, 
suddenly like NTP servers showed up, there is a name server configured up there right now, some LLDP configured and things like that. Um, and then you could do all this in one step, but I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to make this in a couple of steps here so it doesn't look. So this is on, this is on the Juniper and then on the, on the Arista, same thing. There's suddenly a bunch of like here. There's my NTP servers. Uh, I have a mouse here, right? There. Um, and yeah, my, my name servers, etc. So things like that. And then you can end up doing things um, even more complicated and you start building. And like the, the one thing that we really like about Ansible in this word, world is mostly about templating because you just have a lot of different configurations to play with that you want to template. So once you start like, once you start um, getting into getting into more complicated pieces of like the of the uh, configuration, you damn it, you're trying to like build templates for all kinds of different like you have your IP configuration, you have your BGP configuration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, you know you put it all into and depending on how you use Ansible, you either put it into YAML files or you plug it into like a database where your data is actually stored in and, and then you actually end up having um, more and more templates that you can use against those routers. So what did I configure now? I configured, I configured IP configuration on my interfaces. So if we now look at this again, I've got like a couple of interfaces here now and they got some random IP addresses. Okay, this could be like a customer interface right now facing some customer, right? And then let's say those customers want to go ahead and like set up some BGP config. So this is my customers on the Juniper and then here's some customer configuration now on the, on the Arista. And then if I want to go and set up the same, um, set up BGP sessions between them, I take my BGP template I take my BGP template and I roll that out. And there we go. There we've got some BGP sessions going on now. So this is all getting this is all getting really, really useful. And the same way um the same way we can use uh, data retrieval and structured data out of Ansible as well. So you can say, okay, now tell me what BGP sessions do I have on this router? Are they established? Are they not established? Et cetera, et cetera. So you can do things like, you can do things like now, because we now have two BGP sessions actually going on between those devices and it will tell you, it'll tell you here. So this on, on this is on, this is on the EOS router and on the Arista. It has this session going on and it's enabled and it's up and it's et cetera and it gets that many prefixes and mm -hmm, doesn't get any because I don't have that configured. And then this is the same portion for, um, for the Juniper device and it has exactly the same keys configured and everything. And this is starting to get useful where we now can, you know, take software on top of this and actually start using this for detect issues and you know configure things automatically etc okay most of the demo worked i'm happy <laughs> this is not too bad um this is i've, I've done this demo, i've done this demo a couple of times before so this is on my github if you wanna if you wanna look at the actual ansible scripts there they're all online okay do we have any questions the bad, bad world of networking. <laughs> short, short intro into the world of networking. And yes, we have a number of questions. Okay, shoot. So, uh, how can we automate our home networking equipment? <laughs> what vendor? <laughs> Because this is this is always this is always the first question, right? right. If you want to automate something, what vendor, what OS? Uh, pro you possibly need to know what version, because sometimes they support something from version hmm, onwards and and not. So if, just, if you just have like a TP link in your no. There's a second question that seems to be related. What cheap network hardware has good scripting or automation support? Um, Arista. 
Arista? Arista is great. I'm not sure if you can say it's cheap, but compared to Juniper and Cisco, it's cheap. So if you can get your hands on like something Arista-like, that's probably a very good idea. Um, and then I didn't mention that, but there is a there is a big push these days also towards uh, more like white box switching routing, where you typically so people write. Um, a network OS that you can just load on like a regular kind of server that has, if it has enough network interfaces that you can, that is enough for your networking needs, um, then you can just load that up on a router. And this is a very cheap version of doing things as well. So, yeah. Any specific recommendation in that case? For like white box switching, I don't know, Cumulus, that's kind of stuff like that. Any model so we can Google right after? <laughs> Also yeah, no, Google Cumulus, and they will tell you like what they support and what what hardware they support. Because like huh? that that's the problem that you have with like the regular vendors is you cannot take their OS and load it onto any box. Right. So that's what they're trying to do differently. Uh -huh. Another one. Uh, what do you think about software-defined networking? Uh, are we going to end up with one OS to any hardware? Um, that's two different things, right? So having a having a neutral OS that you can load onto any box is one thing. Software-defined networking is trying to get so software-defined networking is trying to program more in because this is all about like config automation and data retrieval, and SDN is trying to b be more like configure actual protocols on the devices and 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 make them a little bit um, adapt them to people's needs. I would say. What do I think about SDN? I think about SDN that if we can't get config automation right yet, how are we going to like change the protocols by ourselves? Um, you know, people use it and people have their valid use cases for it, but it's definitely not something that you can just take and apply and it works kind of thing. You need to, you need to have like your long-term projects trying to work out what your actual needs are, what you can do differently. You know, you can do things like, people do things like, um, people do things like, uh, it, you know, some routers, if the, if the router is not powerful enough, sometimes they're not able to handle one or multiple full routing tables, because routing tables are getting pretty big, and then calculating out what your path is, et cetera, is trying to get like a um, capacity problem on the device. So if you take the cheap routers, you typically cannot have three different upstreams and y your router just can't handle it anymore. So people have been doing things like if they know that they only send like 90% of their traffic goes to like the first 10% of the routing table and then nothing else further. People have been doing things like uh, program their routing table specifically with the path that they need and nothing else and you know to save, um, to save resources on the box. You can do things like that, but then you need to have a very in-depth analysis about where does your traffic go, what kind of paths do you need, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a little bit of a bigger issue. But yeah, things are, people are doing it. And once we can program everything, maybe we'll, it'll, get easy, it'll get easier. Next one. Looks like you are still using Python 2.7. Any plans to migrate to Python 3? <laughs> <laughs> Who asked this? <laughs> I might have an idea. No, we talked about this over beers the other night. So um, a, lot of the a lot of the underlying libraries have issues and don't support Python 3. It's probably not that big of a deal because a lot of it is just text processing and the dependencies, you know, there's maybe a dependency on like the netconf library or something like that. So it shouldn't be a huge deal to, to make it all compatible. I know the Juniper library, I think, is now Python 3 compatible. So maybe it's not that terrible ter to actually do it. But yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we probably will. I mean, you know, the libraries we use, there's like five of them. And you already answered this partially. Do you have any experience to share with tools such as Ansible, Salt, uh, Slack, or Napalm? Slack or Napalm? Wait, what? <laughs> um, do you have any, any experience to share uh, with tools such as Ansible, Salt? Right, Slack so, so Napalm, uh, yeah. Napalm specifically has Ansible modules and then 
I'm actually, we're, we're, we're still kind of surprised how much it took off because we just, uh, my, David, my friend and I, we just wrote it like, okay, we need something for our use case here and yeah, let's open source it. Maybe it's going to make sense. And then suddenly people at actual companies like, like <laughs> started actually using this to like manage their networks and suddenly we get emails from like Cloudflare and they're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we use this now. Okay, cool. And they started contributing, like the Cloudflare guys really started contributing heavily to Napalm and it probably wouldn't have lived for the past year as much as it did because of them because they're like they're basically managing the project these days because if you're you know if you're using it in your environment they actually have a full-time employee who only contributes to napalm these days it's crazy <laughs> <laughs> so he he wrote plugins into he wrote plugins into um salt so he it, it has like it's it's natively in like salt stack so you can use napalm out of that um what were the other tools I forgot there was ansible and uh, that ansible we had we had napalm slack well yeah people do this like and we're notifications. all we're all chat ops now so we're trying to you know if you do chat ops and you want to integrate your routers into slack yeah if you do like stackstorm or whatever stackstorm has ansible module integration so you need like four steps to get there but you can get there <laughs> how does one handle transactions and ordering of changes uh, not cutting yourself off. Uh, what about resuming when things crash mid-push? Um, right, so with the, the, if you use NetConf, then you're lucky because NetConf pretty much has uh, sensible error reporting and net, NetConf is transactional in a way. So if you send your config and NetConf figures out it doesn't work, it will not apply any of it. Um, so, you know, you know that your, your change did not stop somewhere halfway, but you know that then nothing of it worked. Um, so you can do it. Ordering, ordering is a little bit of a different thing. If you have to order things, you might have to give some thought into like what do I configure first and what do I configure second. But um, as long as you know, use NetConf, tran uh, transactions are not that big of a deal anymore. Uh, changes across the uh, uh, different things across different devices. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. If you need to like have, you know, you might have to need a filter set up here before you turn something on there so it doesn't like, yeah, exactly, populate something wrong. Um, I would probably do this in Ansible in some way because like, you know, we use Ansible for the orchestration around it. And if I know it has to go on this device first and on that device second, I would probably just align my Ansible in that way or salt or whatever people like to use. And how about cutting yourself off? Has it ever happened? Or, um, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do then? How, you Reboot. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, typically you're careful in a sense like, you know, some, some vendors support things like uh, rollback. So you can like on a Juniper, you can do like commit and co commit and wait 10 minutes. And then if things, you know, 10 minutes later, unless you confirm, it will roll it back to the previous version. So some vendors have functions that make this easy. Um, if you have a global network, then you're fucked. And if you have a local network, then you get in the car and drive in a data center and plug in your cable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you execute raw commands via, so this is an Ansible implementation question. Do you execute raw commands via Ansible on the devices or, or do you actually execute Python modules there? Um, so this, the, what I showed just now was Napalm modules just executed through Ansible. So yeah. The, um, there might, I think there is a module now, but it's fairly recent in Ansible that speaks netconf directly. So you could theoretically do it that way too, but you know, why not use yet another abstraction layer? <laughs> <laughs> what about security? Automation will not uh, also enhance security issues as well, besides doing good stuff? Um, it's, less it's less security, it's less, in my opinion, a security issue because you access it still the same way. So netconf, uh, underlying netconf is still an SSH session. So you still typically use like, you know, you use SSH keys or something like that if you want to do things okay. Um, the bigger problem, the bigger problem is not really in terms of security, but in terms of, damn it, I just had a thought and now I lost my thought. Okay, uh, next question. I'll come back to that in a okay. minute. <laughs> Um, is there any module for iOS XE? I don't know. Uh, I maybe, maybe. I I gotta look that up. But 
there might be an Ansible module for XE, uh, and the and the important thing to like check for because the module not all of the not, not all of the modules use netconf or an API. So like the important thing to watch out for if you use modules that support older versions, they might just be CLI based, so they might not support transactions and things like that. But um, people have been playing around just with CLI and modules, so it kind of looks the same. Not quite the same underneath, but yeah. Okay. So funny, oh yeah, funny thing. So there was for for Cisco, whatever, I forgot what version it was because we were trying to figure out how to do transactions and we couldn't really, um, and we didn't really want to do it on the CLI. This guy, Kirk, came up with like, so what if I just take my config file SCP it up to the router and then load it. And then it's kind of transactional, right? Because I'm loading the whole config file at once and I'm not typing every line anymore into the CLI. So those are the kind of tricks that you have to go through if you do that. A little work around there, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, oh, you, looks like you may have a potential contributor here. Can we contribute with migration to Python 3? Uh, absolutely. We'll talk about that in the car. <laughs> <laughs> if those Python 3 questions all come from the person that I think is driving back with us today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and those are our last questions. So thank you so much, Elisa. Uh -huh. We really enjoyed you having okay. you.